Hello, my name is Logan and I'm your host, The Mighty Pirate. In today's video, I'm going to discuss aerospace. This video is going to be much longer than normal, so buckle in. My sources for today's video are Aerotech 1, Aerotech 2, and Sarna.net. With the discovery of the Grey Death Memory Core, Intersphere Technologies began to approach the technology level of the Star League era. The clan invasion prompted the houses to step up their research and development efforts to create war machines capable of meeting and possibly defeating this threat. The term dropship was first used in the 21st century to describe huge cargo carrying shuttles transported by the relatively primitive jump ships of the era. As jump ships and dropship technology advanced, the nature of both vehicles changed. By the term dropship became official in the late 25th century, it referred to interplanetary non-FTL craft carried on the hull of a jump ship, rather than inside its cargo bays. These dropships, considerably more versatile and sophisticated vessels than the huge cargo shuttles that they replaced, would drop free of the jump ship's docking collars on the arrival of their destination. The term shuttle remained in use and applied to the small craft with cargo capacities of 100 tons or less. These shuttles are often carried within the dropships and jump ships cargo bays. The Terran Registry records more than 250 different dropship designs, many which have been long since obsolete. Approximately 100 different models remain in service throughout the inner sphere, ranging from small attack craft to huge cargo transports. 20 designs make up the majority of the ships in service, grouped into the following six classes. Troop carriers, battle mech carriers, fighter carriers, assault ships, cargo carriers, and passenger liners. All dropships are either spheroid or aerodyne designs. Spheroids, so named for their distinctively rounded hulls, rely on their fusion drives to provide lift. Aerodynes rely on wings and aerodynamic hull shapes to provide lift for atmospheric flight. Generally smaller and more maneuverable than spheroids, the aerodyne dropship's winged aircraft-like design makes it ideally suitable to atmospheric operations. However, the aerodynamic requirements of aerodynes limit their size and drastically increase the cost of building these sleek, graceful craft. Another disadvantage is that most must land on a long, flat stretch of a runway like a conventional aircraft. This dependence on prepared landing surfaces and support makes the aerodyne dropships less versatile than spheroids. To enable aerodyne dropships to operate both in atmosphere and in space, most aerodynes have two sets of exhaust nozzles, one rear mounted on the craft's bottom and the other at its rear. Although this configuration occupies more space than a simple drive, it alleviates the problem of internal orientation. If the craft is in the atmosphere and affected by planetary gravity, it uses different exhaust nozzles for thrust, allowing the craft's nose to remain forward and its rear to remain aft. Aerodynes use this bottom thruster and transit drives for space travel and switch to maneuver drives and aft thrusters for atmospheric operations. Having a simpler hull design than aerodynes, spheroid dropships are much easier and cheaper to construct. The simplicity and sturdiness of the spheroid hull design allows the construction of much larger spheroids. The largest spheroid currently in production is the behemoth, weighing in at 100,000 tons, whereas the largest aerodyne only weighs in at 10,000 tons. Spheroids have a one-drive system used for both space travel and atmospheric maneuvering. The positioning of the drive at the ship's bottom, as well as the shape of the hull, allows spheroids to take off, hover, and land vertically. This capability gives the spheroid dropship enormous versatility, but it also makes it extremely vulnerable. Because the drive thrust provides direct lift in the atmosphere, steering is accomplished through a complex system of control thrusters mounted on the ship's hull. Any damage to these thrusters can severely impair the craft's handling. However, its ability to land in almost any type of terrain makes the spheroid dropship extremely popular with the military. The largest mech transport the Overlord dropship can deposit a battalion of battle mechs directly onto a battlefield under almost any condition. Jump ships are the backbone of interstellar travel. These slender, needle-like craft were first developed in the 22nd century. Jump ships fall into two categories. First and most numerous is the transport jump ship, such as the Merchant and Invader class vessels. Civilian and military organizations use transport jump ships to convey drop ships between destinations in the stars. The second category, combat jump ships, also known as warships. 
Most of these were wiped out during the first two succession wars. Only since the recent rediscovery of the Helm Memory Core by the Great Death Legion has humankind rediscovered enough technology to build warships. And the pressures of the clan invasions have encouraged more than a few successor states to speed up their warship development and productions. Though the basic design of a warship matches that of a jump ship, the larger warship has an additional maneuver drive, stronger armor, and a more powerful weapons array. In order to accommodate the additional hardware, these combat jump ships use a compact but more expensive version of the KF drive. Because the KF drive in a warship must move a greater volume, it and most other components are larger than their equivalents on board a transport jump ship. Like its transport counterpart, the warship was built around a KF drive. Warship design surrounds the vulnerable drive core with various decks for personnel and equipment, shielding the hull with massive layers of armor. This bulk enables the vessel to resist enormous amounts of damage. The vast maneuver drives allow the warship to act like a slower version of a dropship, giving it maneuverability superior to that of a standard jump ship capable of one or two Gs of acceleration. A warship can travel within a solar system like a dropship. Such interplanetary flight takes huge amounts of fuel. Most warships consume about 40 tons of fuel per burn day. However, the mere presence of one of these such juggernauts makes most forces think twice about attacking a jump ship or a dropship fleet. The smaller relative mass of the compact KF drive in relation to the overall vessels provides vast spaces on the warship in which to fit large weapons weighing thousands of tons. Long range and deadly, these powerful weapons can inflict inordinate amounts of damage on the enemy vessel. However, their large size makes it difficult to aim quickly and accurately. So. Warships tend to use their weapons to engage large, slow-moving targets such as dropships and other warships. The warship's ability to accelerate enables it to produce ship-wide artificial gravity, removing the need for a grav deck. Warship decks are arranged so that the nose of the craft is up and the engine section is down. Many larger warships continue to carry two or three grav decks for use while in orbit or while waiting at a jump point, when the vessel is not accelerating and therefore has no gravity. Like dropships, warships fall into categories determined by their role. Corvettes are the smallest warships, lightly armored and relatively swift. These craft usually mass less than a half a million tons. Designed for extended operations, they most often see action as raiders or convoy escorts. The next largest ship class is the Destroyer, occupying a similar niche but far more heavily armed. In addition to raiding and escort duty, destroyers often guard orbital installations. Most destroyers mass between 500,000 tons and 700,000 tons. Following the destroyer is the frigate. Frigates rarely mass under 700,000 tons and serve as both picket vessels and escorts. Usually equipped with top-notch sensors, frigates often stay on the outskirts of the fleet to act as sentries, providing additional defense in the fleet's core. Unlike smaller ship classes, frigates also operate as transports, allowing dropships to dock at their hardpoints. Cruisers constitute a diverse class of ships, and many aerospace historians would further subdivide them into additional categories of light cruisers, heavy cruisers, and battle cruisers. Cruisers serve as escorts, raiders, or picket vessels, offering speed comparable to frigates or destroyers, but with superior armor protection and firepower. Most cruisers can operate away from support facilities for extended periods, making them ideal as raiding vessels. Heavy cruisers carry more armaments than light cruisers, often at the expense of speed. The clans tend to use heavy cruisers as command vessels. Battle cruisers bristle with weapons and heavy armor, but their large engines provide enough power to give them great speed for their size. These swift behemoths often provide the knockout punch of a fleet. Most cruisers mass between 700,000 tons and 1.2 million tons, though historical records indicate that the Terran hegemony constructed vessels as large as 1.5 million tons. The largest warships are battleships, multi-million ton leviathans whose overwhelming armor and firepower have given rise to much of the mystique surrounding combat jump ships. A vessel of this class usually serves as the flagship of a fleet, leading assaults against stubborn opposition and making a breach in enemy defenses for smaller craft to exploit. Contrary to common wisdom, a battleship size does not imply a lack of speed. Most can keep pace with frigates and can outrun heavy cruisers. 
the 2 million ton McKenna class warship used by the Star League Defense Force in the era of the Star League remained the largest spacecraft ever built for just over four centuries. However, that title is now carried by the Leviathan class warship, a 2.4 million ton warship launched by Clan Ghost Bear in 3055. Aerospace fighters make up the bulk of clan and inner sphere fleets. Massing less than 100 tons, these swift moving craft operate in space and atmosphere with equal ease. These fusion powered vehicles use a drive system similar to a dropship's. Clusters of small chemical thrusters enable the fighter to maneuver in a vacuum. A fighter's large engine gives it a considerable advantage in speed and maneuverability over dropships and jump ships. They move too quickly for most large ships to target them. Many fighters can generate 3 to 4 Gs of thrust, and some can produce up to a mind-numbing 11 Gs. However, the pump systems used by most fighters to provide fuel does not allow them to maintain these high accelerations for long periods. The aerospace fighter's small size also restricts the amount of weapons and armor it can carry. All aerospace design reflects the necessary trade-off between firepower, protection and speed. Despite the many limitations, fighters are relatively inexpensive to build and maintain. When used in mass fleets, they pose a devastating threat to even the largest, most well-protected spacefaring vessel. That will conclude my video on aerospace. While I was looking through the various manuals trying to research this video, I found a quote from Jordan Wiseman and he was one of the initial developers of Battletech, or originally Battle Droids. And the quote is as follows. The real strength of the Battletech universe comes from you, the readers, fans, and players. The fan fiction and art plays a huge part in keeping us all involved in the universe we share and love. I remember being at a convention soon after the publication of the first version, then called Battle Droids, and having players tell me the stories of their units and battles. Thankfully, 25 years later, they are still telling them. And that quote is from Battletech 25 Years of Art and Fiction by Catalyst Games. I'm going to set up a Patreon account for this channel. I don't need any of the currency for myself, I just want to use it to commission artwork. Well, I want to commission new artwork for Battletech. I want the community to be able to watch my channel and enjoy new artwork about some of the content that they already know and love. I don't want to make any money off of this. I want to keep it non-monetized. I don't want to put any commercials in. But if you want to donate to my channel so we can get new artwork on there, or if you know any artists or you are an artist, please send me an email and that would be really helpful so we can get better artwork out there for us and for people who might like Battletech in the future. Thanks so much for watching guys. It was a lot of fun to make this and I hope to catch you guys in the next video.